Greetings, Missio Day. Philip Hatton here, founding editor of Missio Day, one of the founding editors. You guys are used to watching Jonathan do all of those great interviews on our YouTube channel. But Jonathan asked me to do a short video on biblical interpretation. Here I am. Well, let's get into it. We're going to take a look at Bart. Armin and Brant Petrie, a video that's on YouTube. I sped it up a little bit to, you know, try to get around some of those copyright um, so we don't get the uh, video struck down. So let's go ahead and take a look at this. Now, this is a debate where Bart Armin was debating another uh, Christian apologist, and Brant Petrie is actually in the audience, Catholic theologian Brant Petrie. And during the Q&A uh, part of the debate, he asked uh, Bart Armin a question regarding a divine claim in the Gospel of Mark. So let's take a look at the video here and see uh, Brent Petrie's question to Bart Armin. Yeah. My question is about the charge of blasphemy in Mark, in particular in Mark 14, and it's for Dr. Aaron, but uh, I'd like to hear what both of you think. So I thought I heard you saying that Jesus doesn't claim to be divine in the earlier Gospels, in particular in the Gospel of Mark, and yet we were just looking at um, the account of the trial, or Caiaphas, where Caiaphas asked him, are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? He says, I am, and you'll see the Son of Man through the right hand of power and come in the clouds of glory. And then they charge him with blasphemy. He's quoting there Psalm 110 and Daniel 7. So my question is, I just want to be clear, is Jesus claiming to be divine there? If he's not, then why do they charge him with blasphemy in the context of a question about his identity? Yeah. And second, why does he quote Psalm 110 in Mark? I'm sorry, well, this part's the same question because it ties into preexistence. In Mark 12 and Mark 14, he quotes Psalm 110, which is the one psalm in the Old Testament that says, before the day star, I have begotten you. So it isn't implicit preexistence there. So two questions uh, in one, I hope, sorry. <laughs> my main question is, is he making a divine claim there? All right, so... Uh, Dr. Petrie just uh, kind of reiterates his question to Bart Armin uh, regarding the quotation of Psalm 110 in the uh, trial of Jesus before the high priest in Mark's Gospel, chapter 14. Um, definitely would be uh, verse 62 and, of course, the high priest's reply after Jesus um, may, uh, quotes uh, Psalm 110. So, there's a few problems with uh, Dr. Petrie's line of questioning that we're going to talk about in this video. Uh, the first uh, is um, his quotation of Psalm 110, verse 3, and the implicit divine claim regarding, um, or excuse me, implicit preexistence um, regarding the day star quote. Now, there's two things that I did when researching this question that's going to come out in my article. So, for some reason, it's in fashion for a Catholic apologist to say, well, if a person in the Bible or first century um, AD Palestine, they quote the first line of a psalm, it means they're quoting the entire psalm. So, I did a little bit of research on that, and really what comes up is that's there's just no indication that's actually true. And usually Psalm, or excuse me, what, what it's regarding is Jesus says, quoting a Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And that's how typically apologists and theologians have answered that question. Well, it means the entirety of Psalm 22. And if you read the entire Psalm, therefore, um, there's like, you know, the redeeming, aspect of the psalm um, in the entirety of the psalm. Well, I think that's what's being done uh, by Dr. Petrie here with regarding Psalm 110, because Jesus in the uh, the trial before the high priest um, does quote the first verse of Psalm 110, um, and therefore it's the assumption that the whole psalm must be quoted. But there's no indication in uh, by the author uh, Mark, or nor would his audience actually assume that verse 3 is meant by the quoting of verse 1 or the entirety of Psalm 110 when it pertains to the identity of Jesus himself. And this is important because let me, uh, I'm going to bring up part of my paper here for you guys. So, let me look up here. All right, so my textbook 
when I was getting my master's degree in uh, sacred scripture or master's in theology and sacred scripture uh, was the elements of biblical exegesis by Michael J. Gorman. And Michael J. Gorman makes a, an important, um, important point when it comes to exegesis. So let's see if I can find. Okay. So this is the money quote when it comes to Gorman. Gorman says, one issue for beginning exegetes, especially when reading biblical narratives, is the failure to distinguish between the historical context of the text's author and audience, on the one hand, and the narrative context of the characters in the story, on the other. It is the former, not the latter, that we mean when we discuss the historical context of a text. Now, when it comes to biblical interpretation, the, the literal meaning of the text is very important. What does the author mean? What does the, um, the audience, uh, what do they believe they are receiving? So when we ask in the narrative, why is the high priest charging Jesus with blasphemy, this is the narrative context that, you know, what's going on here. So where it's the latter part that's being asked here by Dr. Petrie. So this is an exegetical error. He is not asking what does Mark attend and how does his audience receive it? That's what Gorman's making the point here. And so Brant Petrie's questioning to Bart Arman is actually flawed. That's one point. So when I was taking a look into more research about this, so furthermore, the first time in early Christianity, and this is a good book on the topic, it's a 150-page uh, dissertation thesis on the topic of uh, Psalm 110 in early Christianity. It's called Glory at the Right Hand. It's written by David M. Hay. And he goes through this entire questioning um, of, the, uh, of the trial with Jesus before the high priest. And he does take it a step further because he says there's an important interpretive key to this trial that, that appears two chapters before. And that's when Jesus is teaching in Jerusalem. So first thing before we get there, it's important to note that the first time that Psalm 110 verse 3, uh, with the implicit preexistence, um, the first time that that occurs in any Christian writing is Justin Martyr. And Hay goes over this. And so this is important because when it comes to Mark and his audience, well, that that can't be what Mark is meaning because it just comes so far later after, um, you know, some of the early writings of Christianity. Now, if you're a believer and of course you've assented to faith, you can of course say, oh, well, the do or the, you know, the doctrine it developed or the understanding has developed through tradition and the revel, um, the revelation of tradition itself through Justin Martyr in the magisterium with its authority. Okay, you can make those claims. Um, but when it's regarding the interpretation of Jesus' quote in itself regarding Mark's gospel, no, it, I mean, it's just, it's just not what Mark's doing there. So uh, Dr. Petrie definitely makes an ex exegetical error. So when we get to, let me bring it up here. So we get to the question about David's son. All right. So as Jesus was teaching in the temple, he said, how do the scribes claim that the Messiah is the son of David? David himself, inspired by the Holy Spirit, said, the Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I place your enemies under your feet. David himself calls him Lord. So how is he this son? The great crowd heard this with delight. 
In the course of his teaching, he said, wait, what happens here? See, one of the things that uh, Hay remarks in this is that this is probably a authentic, one of the very few authentic uh, points of exegesis made by Jesus himself. And why scholars think this is because it's open-ended. Mark doesn't answer it for you. He just leaves it in the air. And so Jesus is making the claim. Here you see um, a citation of Psalm uh, 110, verse 1. He's making a connection with his identity with uh, Psalm 110. And then we get to later, when we get into the trial, uh, Mark uh, chapter 14, verse 62, and you you will see the Son of Man, see at the right hand of power, and coming with clouds of heaven. So then you get a pairing of Psalm 110, verse 1, Daniel 7, 13, and the Son of Man. So Jesus does identify himself. Mark identifies himself with the Son of Man, mostly Mark because he makes the connection in uh, Mark 14. and who the Son of Man is. Now, in the line of questioning, if you were to watch the rest of that video with uh, Brant Petrie and Bart Arman, is um, what does this mean? What kind of claim is being met here? Now, Mark is making a divine claim. Bart Arman, of course, makes the point, well, it's not really a divine claim, but it is a divine claim because, you know, he is connecting himself with the Son of Man. All right. But he isn't claiming to be Yahweh. Okay, that's actually pretty true. Now, the video presents it as a gotcha to Bart Arman, but Bart Arman actually answers this question pretty closely to be correct. And it's important to make that point because if we're wanting to convince people and we're wanting to evangelize them and bring them to the faith in Jesus Christ, we can't present people with gotchas. We can't uh, present people as foolish when they're not being foolish and when they mostly get it correct. And he mostly gets it correct here. Now, there's something we can go a little bit deeper here. So Jesus is making a divine claim. Mark's making a divine claim in uh, Mark 14. The audience will understand it as a divine claim with Psalm 110. Now, E.P. Sanders, a Protestant theologian, makes the point in his book, The Historical Figure of Jesus. He makes this point. Scholars are kind of wishy-washy on what it means to be the son of man. You know, they, they don't have it quite nailed down. Now, one opinion is, is that the son of man, of course, comes as a viceroy of God the Father, all draped in his authority and power. Huh. Where else have I read that? Something where Jesus is identified as a viceroy or an envoy. Oh, this is exactly how John's gospel presents Jesus. It presents Jesus as an envoy of the Father. You kill Jesus, guess what? <laughs> you, you, uh, you have thrown the father out. You know, you get the parable. Uh, you get, of course, the vineyard parable. So this is how John's gospel presents uh, Jesus as well. So there is a connection between how Mark's gospel views the identity of Jesus and how John's gospel, uh, which Bart Arman would likely admit presents Jesus as God. And so... The difference in it is that, of course, if you get the, of course, John chapter 10, you can pair John chapter 10 with Ezekiel 34, the good shepherd, John 10, and you get uh, Yahweh coming to shepherd his own people. And you read those two texts together and they're nearly, they feel identical to each other. They feel like you're reading the same text. So it's very clear who John's saying Jesus is. 
But at the same time, it's actually very similar. There is a coherence between Mark's gospel with John's gospel. And so you do get a strong understanding of divine claim in Mark's gospel in Jesus acts in the power of God as understood through E.P. Sanders' work. So this is very important. And I think if you were to make this argument and to make it uh, very clear, and I'm, of course, writing an article about this, then this is convincing. What we can't do is try to present um, skeptics as foolish. I mean, it's not it's not going to convince uh, non-believers. We have to be consistent and we have to have integrity. So this is what my research has presented on the topic of divine claims in the Synoptic Gospels. And strangely enough, um, Mark's Gospel is the only one with the blasphemy charge. And the other gospel is you have Jesus kind of deflects the answer, and then also he doesn't address it at all. And so Mark's gospel, which is considered by the consensus of scholars to be the earliest written gospel, actually has the strongest out of synoptic gospels claims to divinity on the identity of Jesus. And I think we really need to hit, hit home that point. All right, so if you did enjoy this video, go ahead and hit subscribe for Missio Day, hit the bell, and you'll see all those great interviews and videos done by Jonathan. And I hope you enjoyed this video, and guess what? Uh, we'll see you soon.